Thanks a lot, all of you, for joining today this webinar about artificial curiosity. Before introducing uh, the three amazing guys that will be the speakers today, uh, just a few words about who we are. We are Women++. Plus Plus. Uh, I'm Marta, uh, one of the board members of Women++. Plus Plus, and uh, the aim of the association is to bring more diverse and inclusive uh, environment within a working place and one of the of the way we do is we try to vehiculate and educate the community uh, for example uh, giving uh, technical talks uh, for introducing introducing different arguments and for this reason today we we have the pleasure to to co-organize this webinar with vision vision is a team of best-in-class engineers who develop high-performing customized machine learning products for a number of the most iconic brands in Switzerland. Whether companies are just entering the field or have a solid data science department, Visium acts as a strategic AI partner to help them identify tasks, processes, or entire function that can be improved through the application of AI systems and realize the full value that these systems have to offer. So that's, I would say, a very good description of, 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 their, of their job. And in particular, about the, the, the three speakers today, we have Axel. He, he is an experienced AI speaker and an AI consultant with a strong history in working in, in various industries. In 2018, after finishing his master in computational neuroscience from APFL, he joined Vision, working closely with Thibault and Gatten, the other two speakers, in helping businesses leverage the ever-growing potential of AI and machine learning. Prior to that, he worked as a data scientist in a Dutch neuromarketing company and a digital epidemiology laboratory at the campus Biotech from the PFL. We also have the pleasure to have Gatten here. After his master in electrical engineering at the PFL, Gatten was the first machine learning engineer to join Vision in its mission to democratize AI, successfully leading projects around anomaly detection, object tracking, and generative models, among others. Beforehand, Gaetan worked on the speech and motion recognition at Squizcom. Last but not least, of course, Thibault. Thibault has been working as a machine learning engineer at, uh, with Vision for the past two years. He developed and led projects in a wide range of domains, from computer vision and sales forecasting to generative models and document analysis. Previously, he applied deep reinforcement learning at Sony, designing a system which can create novel machine learning systems automatically. So, I uh, don't want to take more uh, of the time today, and I want to, to leave the stage to Vision. Just uh, one thing about question answer. Uh, so, uh, feel free to write it on the chat, and, and the guys will, uh, will manage the, I mean, all, the, all your curiosity about uh, the topic today. So please, yeah. Great, thank you very much, uh, Marta, uh, for this introduction. Uh, so how uh, this is going to look like, uh, I'm going to start explaining some theoretical conceptual concepts. Uh, and then we'll have Thibault and uh, Gaetan uh, taking turns in uh, showing you certain uh, code snippets and more practical aspects of the artificial curiosity. So. Machine learning can be split into three main areas. Uh, so you have the supervised learning, uh, where you have uh, labels, for those of you who know uh, what those are. Uh, but the, the type of uh, applications that you can work with here is more around regression uh, and classification. So classification is quite straightforward. Uh, regression, uh, you can see it as trying to predict what is going to happen in the future. Then you have uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, where you do not have the label, so you do not know uh, what your data means, let's say, right away. So there's different areas, again, in this, uh, where you have the dimensionality reduction, where you kind of reduce the, the dimensions that you consider when you have a lot of dimensions uh, with your data. And then you also have, of course, the clustering, uh, where you're going to look at the data, look at patterns, and try to regroup uh, different data points together uh, in order to put them together. Then uh, what we're going to talk about today uh, is the reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning uh, is not completely supervised learning, it's not unsupervised learning, it's a different type of learning. And the concept uh, is quite straightforward. 
uh, this way, great, you'll have the pointer. So the, the concept of reinforced learning, learning sorry, is that you have an agent that is evolving in a specific environment. Uh, so the agent, when he is in a specific state uh, that you see here uh, from the environment, is going to take a specific action. Based on that action, there's going to be a change on the environment, which is going to bring the agent into a new state. And also at the same time, uh, there's going to be a reward uh, given, to, given to the agent. And the objective in here is to select the actions that maximize the cumulative rewards. So you can see this as whenever you're doing something good, you receive um, a treat or something positive, or you can also go the other way by saying that whenever you do something bad, uh, you can receive something negative. And this is overall the concept of reinforcement learning. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to let Thibault already take uh, the, the presentation uh, to present you the concept uh, in action of, a, I would say, not very smart agent for now. So I hope you can all uh, see the screen. I will just share the presentation again. So uh, as Axel mentioned, we're gonna, uh, there is a bit of an interactive part in this webinar. So to follow along, you will have three possibilities. Uh, so the first one, so first I will, I will, if Thibaut or Axel could send uh, the link in the chat so it's easier to open for, for everyone. Um, so this will be a link to the, the repo where you have all the code and the resources for this uh, workshop. Um, and so as I said, you have three possibilities to follow along. The first one, if you want to dig up a bit more in the code and actually run the things uh, yourself during the, the webinar, you can click the Open in Collab uh, button uh, that will be uh, in the GitHub uh, README. And then you will open the Collab environment to run the code. If you, uh, this requires a Google account and for you to sign in with it. So if you don't have a Google account or don't want to sign in, or you just don't want to run the code, you just want to see the outputs, you can also cl click the green badge to open it. Um, and otherwise, uh, if you, you can also just follow along with what we will be showing you uh, directly. So that being said, I will go to this uh, collab environment. Um, so for now that we're here, for those who are not familiar with it and that want to play with the code, you will first need to connect the environment by clicking uh, somewhere here uh, on your computer. Uh, then once it's connected, you can just run the cells. Um, uh, so that's what we're gonna, going to do here. We're just going to run the first few cells. And while it's importing, I will uh, give a few details about what we're going to do. So um, we're, in this notebook, we're going to uh, train different reinforcement learning agents. Uh, first, a random agent, then an agent that is uh, relatively smart, and then finally a curious agent. And uh, we will uh, implement them using the OpenAI Gym framework, and we will have them play in different environments. Uh, here, there are four environments that are uh, implemented for games. Uh, the first one, first two ones are Pong and Breakout from the Atari. And we also have the first two levels of Super, Super Mario Bros, so the original Super Mario game. So the first thing we actually do uh, with this code is we will create the environment using the OpenIGM make environment function. So we can do it for Pong, Breakout, and the two Super Mario levels. And then we will create recorders, a recorder uh, that we implemented uh, pre uh, before the, the workshop, this will let us record everything that our agents are doing in the different games and replay uh, their uh, games so that we can watch exactly what happened. So uh, as Axel said, in reinforcement learning, you have two main components, the agent and the environment. The agent is inside the environment and based on the current state, it will decide on an action that will impact further the environment and give him a reward that can be either positive or negative, uh, depending on if it did uh, an action that is considered as good or an action that is considered as bad. So the first thing we will do is we will well go ahead and see how a random agent can be implemented. Uh, the random agent in itself is not very interesting. 
uh, for its play, but it can it's quite useful as a baseline to understand how difficult uh, task can be to achieve for an actual reinforcement learning agent. So if we take a quick look at the random agent class here, uh, we have one main function, which is the play function. And uh, this function, it has one main part, which is this while loop here, uh, which is the equivalent of this uh, reinforcement learning loop we just described. So in the while loop, we will at each time step uh, sample an action. And here we sample an action randomly from the action space of the current environment, because we have a random agent, of course. And then we perform this action in the environment using the step function here. And what we get out of this is the observation of the new state. Uh, so what ha actually happened with the environment when we perform the action, we get a reward that we can feed to our uh, agent if we want to, to train it. But here it's a random agent, so we don't really care about the reward. And we uh, get an info about is the game over or not uh, in order to know uh, whether we should restart a new game or these kind of things. So uh, otherwise, everything else is uh, just code that is there to help us gather the data, accumulate the rewards, and uh, record the game with the recorder. So if we run this, then we can uh, actually instantiate our first random agent and ask him to play a game, for example, here, uh, Pong. And once it finished playing, we can actually uh, use a recorder to watch what happened with our game. So let's see. So here we are, we are playing uh, one game of Pong, sorry, uh, with 500 uh, time steps maximum, and we are recording it with the recorder one. So now our uh, uh, Pong game uh, got played, and we can press the play button to see actually what happened. So we can see our agent, it is the green bar on the right side. And well, as we can expect, it's acting randomly. Uh, it's basically performing random actions. So it's probably not going to hit the ball uh, ever. Or if it does, it will be by chance. And we can actually uh, implement, uh, well, ask the agent to play other games like Mario or Breakout just by changing the environment, uh, which we will do later when we start building smarter agents. So now I will give it back to Axel so that he can explain to you a bit more about how to build actually a smart agent for reinforcement learning. Um, so what I was saying is um, right now, most of the examples that, that we're going to show you are examples that are mainly around games uh, in controlling agents in a controlled environment. Uh, but it's uh, not only in games that you can see reinforcement learning to be applied. For example, here, uh, we have actually a helicopter uh, which is being controlled by reinforcement learning. So how this model has been trained is that there was a simulation running uh, where the uh, reinforcement learning agent uh, was trying to learn certain figures and so on and trying to reproduce actually certain things that uh, were considered to be good. And now uh, this system is a system that is able to react really well uh, with all the turbulences that you can have uh, by flying a, a helicopter and is able to do a lot of uh, different tricks that we do not see due to the trees behind. But um, these are applications, again, more in a playful, play-free situation, but also actually in the energy sector. Uh, we've actually had uh, found some, some interesting research on this topic by actually controlling um, wind uh, turbine parks in order to improve the settings slightly to actually be able to improve the, the production of energy of those plants. So the, the increase was around 1.5, 1.6, 7%, uh, which can seem as not too much. But what you need to consider is this is simply by tweaking the parameters of the, 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 the wind park, um, which shows a great potential to increase overall the production of these uh, energy sources. So now 
uh, what we're going to talk about is the exploration the exploitation trade-off. So we've seen that uh, the random agent um, is not going to gain anything over time. What we want to, to have uh, is a system that can take actions uh, which can advertly affect future data. So where we stand is we have this trade-off between exploration, so learning more about what is good and bad. So here we are more in, for example, the random um, uh, acting. And then we have the exploitation. Uh, so here you have found something which works well, and you're going to apply this more and more uh, in order to, 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 to gain as many uh, points, I would say, as many rewards uh, as possible. Um, it's always important to find a good balance uh, between both. Uh, so let's say that if you're exploiting something too hardly, uh, there can be a problem. Uh, if you give too much reward or if your reward is too important for your agent, uh, he's going to be behave like a drug addict uh, and could uh, potentially get stuck uh, in a local minimum. And here you can see it in action where you have uh, a model which is teaching this boat how to drive. And he probably has uh, a certain reward function that gives him certain points whenever he gets a booster. So here these, the, 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 the green thingies is probably giving him a lot of, uh, a lot of points for, the, for a lot of rewards, sorry. But the long-term vision uh, is not really uh, assessed because the objective, the real objective of this model is to win the race. But unfortunately, because in this iteration, uh, I hope, and I hope this is not the last, last uh, iteration of, the, of this model, the model has been giving too much weight to these uh, points that you can get during the, the race and did not focus enough on finishing the race. On the other hand, you can also have the other issue, situation, which is this false reward problem. So oh, it's one in a million, so he's saying I still have a chance. We are uh, in a world where we do not get a lot of information right away. We do not always know if uh, we have been doing something good or bad. This is why I would say also games have been so successful, because right away you're able to know um, if you've done something good or bad. And in this space reward problem, uh, what you also see is that the function uh, for reward uh, that you can build uh, for games, if you're in a situation as complex as life itself, how do you build a function uh, that is able to, to answer this? Uh, before we're going to get that, to that, uh, I'm going to let, I guess, Thibaut uh, as I was wrong before, uh, present the actor critic uh, architecture, uh, which is a way to improve uh, the, the random model that we've seen until now. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, yeah, so that's me again presenting that part. <laughs> uh, I hope you can see the slides correctly. So uh, the first ar architecture that, uh, of uh, a reinforcement learning agent that we're going to look at today is the actor critic architecture. It's a relatively state-of-the-art architecture, but state-of-the-art evolves quite fast in reinforcement learning nowadays, so uh, maybe not so much, but it's still uh, simple enough for us to, to present in this uh, short webinar. So in the actor critic uh, setup, you have two uh, main component on well three if you consider the environment uh, the two components are the actor and the critic the actor is basically our agent uh, if you consider the the pong game we had before it would be the little racket for example and this actor given uh, a state it will decide the next action that it should take in order to maximize the long-term return which is its long-term rewards that it gets from the environment uh, on the other end, the critic, you can see it as a very experienced player that is uh, looking at what the actor is doing. And this uh, critic tries to predict, given the current state and given how good the actor typically perform, it will try to predict how, much, how many rewards, how much long-term return the actor will get. Um, 
and the actor on the other side, it will try to impress the critic by getting actually more uh, rewards than the critic expected. So if we now go into uh, the coding again, so we had our little Pong game. Uh, here we have a, the same description as uh, we had uh, just before with the three uh, parts, the environment, the critic, and the actor, but in a slightly more technical way. But again, it's the same. Uh, the environment is in a certain state, and uh, it, the critic, you have the critic and the actor, the actor takes an action, and the critic tries to evaluate how, many, how much reward the actor will actually get. So in order to implement this actor critic class, um, first we need to define what the actor and the critic actually are. In our case, they will be neural networks, since we will, and we will train them using backpropagation. So first we need to init these uh, networks. If you want to go further, uh, you could, what an interesting thing could be to try to change the way this neural network actually works and, and how they are implemented. So we define our networks. We also define an optimizer to train them. And finally, we define uh, a memory. Um, the memory is a very important part in reinforcement learning. Uh, you might be aware that in machine learning in general, uh, and also specifically in deep learning, you need uh, a lot of data to have your model learn anything. If you want to build, for example, an image classifier that can differentiate cats from dogs, you need a lot of images, labeled images of cats and dogs. But in reinforcement learning, we don't have uh, such thing as data. What we do have, however, uh, is a memory of our past experiments, uh, all the past games that the agent played, all the different uh, choices it made, the different act actions it took, and how it impacted him, how it impacted the environment, and how much rewards it actually gave him. So. Uh, that's why we have this memory for the actor critic agent. Then uh, we have again this play function, uh, just as before. And here, uh, again, the while loop, which is the feedback loop from the reinforcement learning scheme. What is also interesting for the actor critic is that it works using a rollout. So here we have a rollout window of 20 steps. This means that the actor uh, will play for 20 steps. 20 time steps, and the critic will try to predict the value for 20 time steps. And it's a bit like equivalent, for those of you who are familiar with it, with the batch size in deep learning. Uh, when you do computer vision, for example, uh, you would have a batch size of 20. Here is a rollout window of 20. So once again, we need to uh, get, uh, so we have the, the actor that needs to take an action. The action this time is not random, but it's defined by the neural network of the actor, and it's based on the current state. Uh, and so this action, uh, we also we get the action. We also get the predicted value from the critic uh, given the current state. And so what will be the expect? What does the critic expect? The expected the cumulative reward will be for the the actor in this state. Now that we have the action, we can uh, actually perform it in the environment, and we will get the new state, once again, the reward, and finally, uh, is, is game over flag, and we will uh, get every, all of these information into the memory. And at the end of the rollout window, we will back propagate the loss into the neural network to train them. So this is uh, more or less how the actor critic will work. If you have specific questions on the to, to ask in chat, we will also take some time to answer them either directly or uh, later on. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have a, a question uh, in the chat about why only 20 steps? Okay. And um, I don't know if you want to answer it or... Yeah, uh, so it could be more, it could be less. Uh, 20 steps was sufficient for us uh, in our scheme to define, well, for the model to learn what is doing over time and what will happen in the future. If you take something that is too long, uh, you will. it will be difficult for the short-term actions you take. Uh, it will be difficult to understand the long-term return uh, very far away in time, and it might also be irrelevant to go too far. Um, I don't know if you want to add on that, Thibault. 
Um, yeah, so it's uh, an hyperparameter that you, you choose depending on your computational resources mm. and depending on the environment. So uh, if, if you are in an environment where you expect the uh, dependencies to be very long range and an action that you take now could have consequences in hundreds of steps, uh, you might want to try longer rollouts. Uh, typically in the environments we're going to play with today, uh, 20 steps is enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, good. So now that we defined the actor critic architecture, we can actually uh, well ask the model to play the Super Mario game. Um, and while it is training, we will have a short look at what it will actually look like because it takes a bit of time to train. So I hope you can see uh, the video uh, well in the call. So. So here we have the, the Pong environment first. Uh, we are training on Mario, but we will demo the, the first few insights here on the video with the, the Pong environment. So regarding the setup, you can see that you have the observation on the left here. The observation uh, are divided into four consecutive frames that are stacked on each other. Um, we need to have these four consecutive frames in order to uh, bear with trajectories and uh, time dependencies. Uh, because, for example, if I stop, let's say, the video here, uh, it's impossible to say in which direction the ball is going just based on the, the frame that we see on the left. But if you actually have four consecutive frames, you can understand directly in which direction the ball is going. So this will help the model to, to learn quicker. So we have these four consecutive frames. Uh, then we have uh, CNN and RNN that are here to extract uh, features uh, about the, the current state, so to help the network understand what is happening. And here, since the uh, actor critic is not yet trained, we can see that the features are pretty much random and they don't change a lot. Then you have on the top, you have the uh, actor policy. The policy is the probability for the actor to pick each action at each time step. So here we can see that, again, since it's not trained, it's pretty much random any time. Uh, in the bottom, you have the, the value of the critic. So the value that it expects the model to, uh, the actor to get in the future. And on the far right, you have the actual reward function. And here, the reward function is defined as uh, minus one when you lose the ball and plus one when you actually get the ball. Uh, when you score a point, sorry. So here uh, we are now at 0 0.5 million training steps and we can see that the features start to move. Uh, they more or less follow the racket and they will also later on follow the ball. Uh, one interesting thing is that the actual value function of the critic is now much lower than before. Uh, before and it used to be around zero, now we are at an average of minus two or minus 2.5. This is because the critic understood that the actor is still very bad. As you can see on the video, it's losing every ball. Um, so it thinks that the actor will lose. And uh, the closer the ball gets to the right side, the closer it is to lose. So the further uh, down the value function gets, because it expects the, the actor to lose and to get a negative reward very soon. And as soon as you, the ball is missed, then you see the value function go up. Um, which means that the uh, the negative reward is now behind us, and we will not getting it be getting it again. But still, the network is very bad. Now, if we fast forward a bit in the training, uh, maybe yeah. I can just jump in because we we got a bunch of uh, bunch of questions. Questions, yeah, of course. So the the first question is uh, about these four frames. Uh, why four frames and not just two? Mm -hmm. And this is basically a uh, standard hyperparameter. Yeah, um, same as the yeah it's, it's um, typical for Atari games, especially, uh, to have these four uh, frames stacked together. Um, it's, let's say, one of these common pre-processing steps, just like uh, in computer vision, you would have standard way to normalize images, to normalize your data. Um, Choosing four frames is this hyperparameter that's been used in the first papers uh, uh, trying to play Atari games, and that has been kept uh, since then. 
The second question is why do we use a RNN and not an LSTM? Actually, mm -hmm. we put RNN as a global <laughs> term that includes yeah. LSTM, and actually, it, uh, is an it is an LSTM. If you uh, you can go dive into the, <coughs> the code, uh, if you go to the repository, you can access all the source code, uh, mm -hmm. and you will see that it's actually an LSTM running. And the final question was um, the zero, one, and two for the policy. Mm -hmm. They correspond to left, right, or no movement. And indeed, I'm not sure about yep. the order, but that's the three actions that you can take in yes. this game, going left, going right, or doing nothing. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, thank you, Thibault, <laughs> for handling the, the questions. <laughs> So if I resume the video now, uh, we are further in the training at about 3 million training steps now. And we can see that the features are evolving much faster. Uh, and the actor is actually able to uh, send back uh, a few balls and even sometimes score points. And so we see when it scores points that it gets a positive reward on the right side. And actually, if we look also at the value function, what is interesting is that the value function is now not negative anymore, but it is positive and it is also increasing most of the time. Uh, this is because the actor actually became good and the critic saw it. So it, the critic now thinks that the actor will score points. And the same way that beforehand the value was decreasing until uh, the ball was reaching the right side, now it is increasing until the ball reaches the left side where we expect the, the actor to actually score a point. And as soon as the reward uh, is uh, gotten, we have a decrease again in the value function. If we go uh, a bit further than that, we will, well, we can see also another game, uh, another environment. This is the breakout environment for the Atari again. And here the agent is trained for 11 million training steps, which is uh, a bit more. Uh, so it took quite some time, and that, why is it trained for so long? Is because, as you can see, uh, the reward function is, re is very sparse. This is something Axel was mentioning before. So here we get one point every time we break uh, a brick. But uh, when we don't break uh, anything, or when we just move around and the ball is flying, we don't get any reward. We only get improvement when we actually do get a reward. And here, uh, one interesting thing is that there is a, a strategy in uh, breakout. If you want to actually uh, break uh, a lot of bricks very quickly, what you can do is dig, uh, dig up a tunnel inside the bricks. Uh, and when you uh, uh, have your tunnel that is digged, you can throw the ball inside the tunnel until uh, it reaches the top. And then it will bounce around and breaks a lot of bricks from the top. And actually, the agent understand that. If you look at the value function, it is about at five six but as when the tunnel is being dug you will see that the value uh, keep increasing it goes to seven then to eight and as soon as the tunnel is fully opened uh, which will happen very soon it, the, we will see a very like here we see a huge drop a uh, huge uh, increase in the value function it goes up till 12 because the critics see this uh, hole we actually even see it in the feature space if we look in the middle uh, and it it understand that it means we are at a very advantageous position and if we manage to send the ball there we will get a lot of rewards and actually that's what happened later uh, the ball gets up there and we see on the right side the reward now is not so sparse anymore but we have a lot of consecutive rewards very quickly okay now um this is was for uh, these two environment if we Look now at what happens with uh, the Mario environment. Uh, again, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to, to interrupt. So the, the Mario environment is slightly different, and there are uh, three main differences, I would say. First one is the policy. As you may have seen, the policy uh, in Pong, as you noticed, was uh, only three actions, left, right, or not moving. But here we have actually 12 different actions uh, with the different buttons you have and you can also combine the directions to go diagonally and things like that um, so th it makes the the problem much more complex for, to grasp for the agent now the second uh, big difference is regarding the reward function uh, the reward function was sparse for pong and breakout we could define it easily by saying okay we get one point when we uh, win a point or when we break a brick but for mario we it's uh, as Axel discussed earlier. It's more difficult to define uh, an actual um, reward function. 
If you want to say uh, you get one positive reward every time you finish the level, the reward will basically never happen by uh, playing random at the beginning, and it will be very difficult for the model to learn anything. So what we did here is we have a different reward function where we give slight uh, small positive rewards when the Mario goes to the right side, because that's where the objective is, and we give small negative rewards when it goes to the left side. Also, um, we can give him sorry, we can give him some uh, positive rewards when he get coins or when it get items, uh, these kind of things. We have a uh, questions yeah. about the policy. Yeah. So the question is, uh, why does the height of the policy plot means, and why mm -hmm. in the previous videos um, the height was pretty high, and yeah. now we have all the bars that are low at the same level? Yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe I should have explained it. So the pol the different values on the policy are actually the. So if you are familiar with neural networks, uh, what you have here is uh, one output per different actions in a in a fully connected layer, for example. And you will apply a softmax on this layer to get the probability for each action. So this, the height of the bar is the probability to take each action. And the bar that is in orange uh, is the action that was chosen for this specific time step. So it will here it was with 80% probability, the action number two. But it could have been the action number zero with about uh, 0 0.2, well, 20% of probability. And the rest of the question was? So the rest um, of the question was, why here the bars are so high, yeah. while in the right. Mario uh, environment, uh, or even here, mm -hmm. uh, it was all the bars at the same level? Yeah. So if we look at in the beginning, oops, sorry, in the beginning of the Pong training, uh, the bars are all at the same level, because, and it's about uh, one third, each of them, because uh, it's a probability distribution across the actions. So th the sum of all the bars is always one. And here, the agent doesn't know basically what to do. So it will pick at, pick at random. That's why it picks with the same probability each action. When you look at the, the end of the training, mostly you see it a lot for the uh, breakout, the value jumps much more because it knows regarding the position of the ball if it needs to go left or right, and is quite sure of what he is doing. So that's why uh, the bar changes a lot uh, during the training. Thank you for the, the question. So uh, now if we go back to the notebook, we will, can actually see the uh, Super Mario agent that we trained. Um, so if we press play here, we trained it actually for 10 games, which is sufficient for us, but it's not a lot. Uh, so we can see that it manages to go forward. Uh, it gets some rewards. It uh, avoids an enemy. It manages also to kill some enemies sometimes. Uh, but it's not really perfect. Like it gets stuck behind uh, this big pipe here. Um, if we go forward, probably it will uh, die at some point if he manages ever to to pass the pipe. Yeah, he passes it and it jumps straight into the enemy. So uh, here again, the, it's not a perfect play, but we can achieve perfect play if we train it for longer. So. Fortunately, we trained uh, the Super Mario agent earlier already uh, for 4 million steps in this environment with the, the loss function. And we can have a look at what happens when we play a game. So we just let it uh, actually play the game. And then we can watch what happens. So one question in the chat yep. is, is there a, a relation on the number of cycles needed versus the number of possibilities? And I would say uh, definitely yes. Uh, like the more complex the environment and the set of actions you can take and also the reward function and how you get your rewards, uh, the more difficult it will be for the model to, to grasp uh, mm -hmm. what it needs to do. And so the longer it will take to, to converge and to actually learn how to okay. play. Yeah, the, the, the way you can think of it is you're trying to learn uh, mapping from a state I'm in, uh, something I observe, and, and I, an action I should take. So if you're in a situation where you just observe a very small set of variables and your choices are very limited, uh, finding an optimal strategy will be much easier than if you observe a super complex environment and you have dozens of ac actions available, for instance. And uh, if you think of um, 
one pretty recent uh, success of uh, reinforcement learning, which was in the game of Go. Uh, the game of Go was um, known to be super difficult because uh, simply of the size of the board. Uh, in the game of Go, you have a 19 by 19 board. It's already much bigger than a chess board, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that change in dimension alone uh, is sufficient to, to make explode the, the number of possibilities, the number of different ways uh, a game can um, roll out. And it definitely makes um, the um, training, uh, I mean, the training needs to be longer if your problem is more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also need to apply smarter strategies for training, Yeah, um, which is what we will see later. So now uh, we can see what actually happened in the Mario game that we played uh, after training for 4 million steps. So we can see that the agent is, well, going straight to the to the right, is jumping, uh, avoiding the enemies, uh, also doing some nice tricks. Uh, yeah, it's basically uh, like almost superhuman performance uh, and it reaches the end of the level quite easily, uh, almost every time I would say. And if we take a look uh, deeper into what is actually happening uh, in this uh, training, you can see it here. So, um, so once again, we see that after 4 million training steps, the features are much more well-defined and the model actually learns what is happening and it learns how to avoid things. Uh, if you look at the policy, it's again very converged uh, and the bar is much more, much higher. Uh, you can kind of guess that this action here is going to the right, probably, and this one is jumping, uh, the two things that Mario does uh, the most. Uh, it gets positive reward all the time for going to the right side, which is uh, good, that's what we want. And finally, another interesting point is that on, again on the value function, we can see that the value function is decreasing all the time. So it starts at around 60, 70, and it's go, it goes down as Mario goes to the right side. This is because uh, there is only a fixed amount of reward you can get by going to the right until you reach the end of the level. So the more to the right you go, the less reward there is to, to claim. And so the critic says, you in the future, you will get less points until we actually reach zero exactly when we hit the flagpole, uh, meaning we got all the, the rewards into the level. Um, yeah, so that's it, I would say, for the actor critic part. If there are more questions, we can take them now, I guess. Otherwise, yeah. really, yeah. Uh, we have one question, which is how much time took the training with 4 million steps? Um, it depends on your computer. Yeah, so it depends <laughs> on your computer, obviously. But um, it could be, um, let's say, I, I trained it on my laptop, actually. And it took, I was going to say, only a few nights uh, of, of training. So uh, I'd say that with uh, four days of training on a standard laptop, nothing fancy, no GPU, um, you can get this agent. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question is, do you know if somebody tried to use reinforcement learning for some real world example in the finance sector, a prediction of financial mm -hmm. crisis, uh, stock exchange fluctuation? Uh, I don't know, maybe yeah. Axel, you have some insights about that, maybe in yeah. portfolio management or something? Yeah, so I would say one of the strengths of uh, reinforcement learning is to uh, find good strategies, uh, new strategies, new ways of doing this. Uh, we haven't touched on that, but for example, a lot of games uh, have bugs in them uh, and uh, reinforcement learning is really good at finding those uh, small things in order to, to hack, uh, let's say, the game. What you also need to be really careful on uh, is how you build your reward function. Uh, so let's say uh, you put um, sensors at the front of your car and you say to your car, okay, you, would, you are going to try to reduce as much as possible uh, the, 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 the accidents that you may do and you have the sensors in front so the, 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 the car should not go into anything. The issue is that the car learns to go backwards and then uh, still has accidents. So you always have to think about these different situations. So I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, there, are, there, there should be quite a lot of um, research uh, on that, on reinforcement learning for portfolio uh, management. Um, that I would say would be the, 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 the approach 
which would be the most logical uh, with the with the application for predicting financial crisis. I mean, the big ones we we would have to see because you also need to to have situations uh, enough situations to to mm -hmm. to understand that, and this is also kind of approaching a bit. Uh, the situation of supervised learning where you would need labels so you know okay the data was like this the financial data was like this and in the end um, a crisis happened so you have an event uh, but those events even though whenever they happen are quite uh, disruptive are not happening a lot so that machine learning could be used uh, to predict them uh, with high accuracy but mm -hmm. you can see of course trends and so on yeah uh, I, I hope this answers your question Thank you, Axel. And then that being said, uh, well, I will hand it back to Axel. We will now present uh, how we can implement Curiosity in uh, this kind of agent. So uh, before talking about how to use uh, motivation, uh, how to use, sorry, Curiosity uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, I would like to talk about two different types of motivations, uh, the extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. On one hand, extrinsic motivation. Uh, so the motivation here is to perform an activity to earn a reward or avoid punishment. If you think about this, the earn a reward and avoid punishment, this is really close to reinforcement learning. And it's kind of, you have a function of success. Let's say that if you win the football game, well, you get a cup, so you have an extrinsic motivation. But there is something else that us as humans uh, motivate us. And, uh, some people, uh, and I would say a lot of people also, uh, perform certain activities not because they're going to be rewarded uh, monetary or physically or in whatsoever way uh, by doing that reward. They simply enjoy uh, doing that activity. And this is called intrinsic motivation. And the issue here is that for extrinsic uh, motivation, it's kind of easy to see how you can create a function and put it into a computer program. The issue with intrinsic motivation, it's way more complex. Uh, so one of the ways that people started thinking about how can we introduce intrinsic motivation uh, in artificial agents is to look uh, into curiosity. So here uh, we have a nice uh, monkey who's going to see actually a magic trick uh, happening. And you will see from his reaction uh, that he is, yeah, okay. <laughs> that he's surprised that there is nothing in the ball. And by being surprised, uh, as we'll see uh, in the minute afterwards, he's kind of interested also in trying to understand uh, what happened. Uh, yeah, he's going to come back. Yeah. Okay, the idea here uh, is that we want to use surprise as a proxy for curiosity. Uh, by being actually uh, surprised by certain things, uh, you will be able to uh, put your attention, let's say, uh, on that event that happened in front of you. Uh, and now, uh, I guess Thibaut is going to explain about um, how we can create this on the architecture level and also how to implement this in your uh, code? Um, the way we will uh, implement Curiosity in our agent is by incorporating new neural networks and new components on top of our architecture critic that we saw previously. Um, we, we talked a bit about the different problems uh, that can be with um, a reward function coming from the environment. Um, in many situations, your reward will be uh, extremely sparse, so it will be difficult mm -hmm. to understand the, the long-term long dependencies, uh, consequences of your actions, because, uh, for instance, you'll play an entire game of chess. After all these moves in the, in the game, you will only get a reward of plus one if you win and minus one if you lose. Um, so it's really difficult to understand what you did good or bad during the whole uh, game if you only get this one bit of feedback uh, for dozens of actions. So this sparsity was a problem. 
And we also saw that example of the, the boat going round and round because the reward function is misspecified and just doing this and getting the boosters in a loop uh, actually gets it more rewards than completing the actual race. Um, so it's always pretty risky to, to and difficult to design a proper reward function. And um, we also saw that the motivation to do things can um, be intrinsic. So instead of specifying a, a reward that comes from the environment, we try to make the agent curious by making the agent itself compute what could be the reward of what I just did. Um, and as Axel just explained, uh, we use curiosity, uh, we use surprise as a proxy for this curiosity. So uh, things that are unexpected um, require our attention and things that are, let's say, boring. Uh, we don't need to particularly explore what's happening if it's a very common situation. So in this trade-off between when to explore and discover new strategies and when to exploit and do what I, I believe is the best thing to do, the idea with this artificial curiosity is to do the thing that I know when the situation is not surprising and I'm in my routine and start exploring when uh, I discover that my actions have unexpected consequences. And the way we implement that uh, on top of this uh, act of critic architecture, uh, I'll put the pointer as well. Okay. So remember, we have this loop of a state, the actor chooses an action, uh, performing the action in the environment leads to a new state. And at that point, the agent receives a reward. So instead of taking the extrinsic reward that comes from the environment, we're going to compute an intrinsic reward. So something learned by the agent itself during the training um, of the actor critic. And this intrinsic curiosity module um, has three components. Um, the first one is a features extractor. So it takes a state as input and tries to reduce the dimensions and create a code for that state, extract some uh, useful information from that state. Um, and then you have an inverse model and a forward model. The inverse model, uh, it takes as, it's kind of a detective. It will take as input um, two consecutive state features. So um, the features of the first state, the features of the state that happened just after, and it will try to predict what was the action that took place in between uh, using the features extracted by the feature extractor. So this inverse model will really encourage the feature extractor to focus on, okay, what are my actions changing in the environment? If I notice some change in the environment, what can I uh, imply uh, about my action. So for instance, if Mario jumps, I observe that at one state I was on the ground, at the next step I was in the air. So I can, uh, the network can more or less understand that this specific action that it took, jumping, has the consequences of lifting the agent in the air. And the forward model, which is maybe the most important part, is um, taking as input the features of a given state the action that was taken in that step, and the forward model is trying to predict the future. So the forward model is trying to predict, okay, what are these, these actions that I just took in one specific state is going to lead me to a new state. What are going to be the features of that st new state? It's trying to predict the next state, basically. And these three components uh, are connected together um, in more or less the way I, I just explained, basically, in this, in this graph. Uh, to compute the intrinsic reward. So you can see that the feature extractor is taking as input, uh, yeah, uh, the feature extractor is taking as input uh, two different observations of the environment and is kind of encoding them. The forward model is taking uh, 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 features about one observation and an action. It's trying to predict the next features. And the difference between these predicted new state features and these actual new state features is going to be the intrinsic reward. The intuition behind that is um, that it models surprise. Um, in Remember that these networks, these neural networks, they are trained on uh, past experience from the agent. So if the agent, uh, if the agent finds itself 
very often in the same situation and always does the same thing in that situation and it always has the same consequences. Well, predicting what's happening for this forward model and inverse model and the feature extractor, it's a pretty easy job. And the difference between the prediction of the forward model and what is the actual new state uh, will be pretty low. Uh, so it's not going to be surprising and it's going to lead to a low intrinsic reward. Uh, on the contrary, if um, I'm, the agent is exploring and doing an action it has never done before, it's going to be really difficult for it to predict what the next state is going to be because he, never, he has never done that before. And the fact that this error from the forward model uh, will be high will lead to a high intrinsic reward and will make the agent curious. So anytime an action has unexpected consequences, the agent wants to try it again to better understand it. Uh, pretty much like this uh, monkey asking to see the magic trick again. So uh, yeah, let's see a videos for this. Uh, no, let, let's first dive into the code and uh, see how we can implement it uh, on top of the actor critic agent we built before. Um, so in the notebook, this is this class curious actor critic agent. Uh, it inherits uh, from the actor critic agent because we still have the actor, we still have the critic that are evaluating how good the states are and what action should be taken. We are only adding new components that are here to compute the reward instead of using the reward from the game. So I can skip most of these util functions. The only one that really changed was is this uh, get reward function. So instead of just returning the extrinsic reward, uh, this function will uh, do exactly what uh, I just went through. Um, it will retrieve from memory different features and uh, uh, consecutive features and actions and encode uh, the, the different observations and try to uh, predict the new next features, try to predict the action that happened between the two features, et cetera, put that in the memory, and basically compute the difference between predicted features and actual features about the next state. And this is gonna be the intrinsic reward. The same, the, the same procedure uh, is applied uh, for the rest uh, of the agent. So uh, again, I insist on that point. The agent we are going to run now is purely fueled by this curiosity. It has no input about what the rules of the game uh, are. So for instance, uh, uh, when we were training the agent on extrinsic reward, um, we designed the reward function thinking, okay, well, in Mario, you want to go to the right. So every time the agent goes to the right, let's give a positive feedback. Uh, and we, we had to plan for all of these options and compute, okay, how much do you want, do we want to reward which part of the agent behavior? And it's pretty difficult to design that function. And all the learning depends on that function. Now we are not controlling anything. We're just showing the observations and we are not sending any reward. Actually, we are not even telling the agent when the game is over. So we are silently restarting the game, but for the agent, it's just one long play. Uh, so we, we are not even telling the agent when he lost. And now we will see uh, how it runs. So let me play this. And um, for this curious agent, we had to pre-train it uh, as well. Um, so you can run this cell to load a checkpoint of this curious agent that was trained for 4 million steps. And uh, we will replay it. Um, in the meantime, I can show you a video of uh, this agent with the details that we, we saw earlier of what's happening inside the neural network. Um, unfortunately, we don't see what's happening inside the uh, curiosity module. We only see the final output, which is this reward. Uh, so we don't have the reward from the game anymore displayed here, but really the reward computed by the agent. 
And without any training, you can see that it's still uh, acting randomly, but you will see with time how it progresses. Uh, we have one question uh, in the chat uh, asking uh, if through the different cycles, the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards keep changing and overall, like the reward function uh, will make it decide the next move with using the these rewards. Um, okay, so the the extrinsic reward is not really changing through time. I mean, it may be, but usually it's a, a well-defined function that does not depend on time. So, for instance, when we showed you previously the the pure reinforcement learning agent without curiosity uh, going right was always rewarded the same way. Um, what's interesting with the curiosity agent is that the reward evolves through time because the reward is computed by a learning system. And at the beginning of the game, everything will seem surprising and the error of the neural network will be super high. And uh, that's why uh, initially we have a reward of almost zero every time because when there is a lot of variance in the reward, we know that it's purely noise because the network is not trained yet. So we, we, we cap it to very small values. Uh, but as the game goes on and goes on, the agent will get used to states he finds itself commonly in. And it will be um, less surprised by actions that it takes more often. So the same action, depending on the stage of training, could have a different reward when we're talking about the curious agents. Because curiosity really is um, a strategy to explore. The goal of exploring is doing new things to see if maybe there is a, an even more optimal strategy that you haven't tried yet, instead of just exploiting what you think you know about the game. And um, Exploration is typically something that is done at the beginning of the training training, and that we fade out uh, progressively. Here with these curious agents, uh, we don't have to choose when to stop exploring as an hyperparameter. We let the agent discover when the agent is surprised, when it's not surprised. So you can see that uh, after one million steps, the agent is going right, jumping over pipes, killing enemies, it's definitely not as good as the pure reinforcement learning agent, uh, but it's pretty impressive considering that, again, we gave no input to the network about the goal of the game. Um, ne we never told Mario that the goal was to reach the end of the, the race. The only thing is uh, Mario is a pretty adapted environment for, for this kind of curious agent because um, the, the, um, the first frame of the game, what the game looks like when you start, it's always the same. So if the agent is random and performing poorly and dying a lot, it will always restart at the same position. So it's a state it, the agent knows really well. So the forward model knows that space and is able to predict what will happen because this is a common situation. But as the agent goes right, uh, it discovers new parts of uh, the level that are really surprising. So the first time Mario gets in front of an enemy, that's something it has never seen before. And that's really surprising that um, it's really difficult for, uh, for the first iterations, at least, uh, for the network to predict that when it goes in front of that enemy, it will go back to the beginning. Um, so the more it happens, the less surprising it will be. So the agent will do it less and less often. At the beginning, the agent will be curious about dying and starting back from the beginning. But as this happens, um, the agent will start to understand that the real surprising stuff, the real new stuff, is by progressing through the level. And we can see that the policy is uh, gaining in confidence, like the Mario is more and more um, is putting a higher and higher po probability on the different actions. Uh, one interesting thing that happens, uh, for instance, here is um, right here. Yeah. So yeah, here we have a drop. No, we have a. Um, a drop in the value function right here. 
So the critic, so the critic is saying, okay, with what, what just happened, uh, I think the agent is in a pretty bad position because uh, he was just in front of an enemy. So again, even without any input on what's the goal of the game, what are the points, um, the networks are able to understand the same mechanism as with the uh, extrinsic reward. Um, maybe I can fast forward a, a bit. We continued to train it for 4 million steps. Um, And it really learns to jump over the holes, get the bonuses. So see, for instance, again, uh, the part where Mario uh, fell into the, the big bits, the big hole. Um, first of all, the value is decreasing. Uh, the critic understands that when Mario is in that position, it's not good. And uh, what happens right after, Mario ends up at the beginning of the game and the frame is totally different and the features extracted by the neural network are totally different. And I guess it was still pretty difficult for the forward model to predict that it will happen because you see this huge reward uh, that happens at that moment. And next time it goes in the pit, same thing. It happens again. So it's always this loop of uh, failures uh, that will make, at some point, the agent understand uh, what his goal is. And I think in the next few seconds, we'll see what's happening when the agent actually succeeds. Um, Yeah, so here you see that big hole that the agent was always falling into. It means that the agent, if the agent was always dying at that point, it means that the agent has never seen what's on the other side. So the time where by mistake, uh, by accident, he manages to get to the other side, everything he, he observes is new. So really surprising. And that makes it really curious. And you can see how the reward is uh, going up. You can see how the critic was starting to go down, but suddenly got up because suddenly everything was new around him. The critic, the critic is always evaluating the actor. So the critic was thinking, okay, usually when there is this big pit in front of me, I die, I go back to the beginning of the game where I know everything. So the reward is going to be low because I'm not surprised and I'm not curious. And as soon as the agent manages to get to the other side, um, the surprise is high, the reward is high, and it means that next time the agent will have uh, less probability to fall into the pit because uh, we will reinforce these actions that led to a good reward. So the actions that led the agent to actually get over the hole, uh, we will try to increase their probability. And that's how, even without being given anything about the rules of the game, uh, the agent is able to perform pretty well. So now we have uh, a recording of uh, the agent uh, trained for 4 million steps. Uh, in your notebook, you should be able to play it as well. And um, while very much like the agent we just saw, it's actually the same one, uh, uh, we, we see how it's able to uh, catch the bonuses, uh, kill the enemies, progress through the level. I don't know if there is any question no question yet. OK. Um, so I guess we can directly go into the next step, which is uh, changing the environment of our agents. Um, because that's also an important point about uh, reinforcement learning and one big challenge about reinforcement learning. Um, we just saw how the agent, the only way for the agent to progress is to um, basically fail a lot. 
so it's very common to train these agents in, simula in simulations, in simulators. Uh, if you want to train a self-driving car, you won't just let your random car uh, go into the streets and have a lot of accidents before learning that it, it shouldn't. Um, even humans, uh, if you want to learn how to pilot a, a plane, you will very probably train in a simulator, a flight simulator, before uh, taking the commands of an actual plane. And so when training um, reinforcement learning systems, it's very often the, the agent is trained for millions and millions of steps of step in a virtual environment, in a simulation, where stuff bad can happen without uh, bad consequences. And then once it's trained and good in that simulated world, we put it into the real world to apply what it did. So basically, we are putting the exploration in the simulation and exploit in the real world. Um, the problem is that your simulation is never a, a perfect model of the world. So um, it's often possible with neural network that your agent will overfit to some aspects that are uh, specific to the simulation and will not behave uh, in the same stable way in the real world, which is much more, uh, much noisier uh, than a simulation. Um, so that's actually a, a very active research topic in reinforcement learning, trying to find more robust algorithms, uh, algorithms that are robust to, to domain shift and changes in the environment. And can we train an, an agent in one environment such that it remains good in another environment that is slightly different? Because if we manage to get these, these agents, we could train them in simulations and then put them into the real world um, while minimizing the risk of something going wrong. And uh, that's something we can simulate uh, by training an agent in the level one of Super Mario Bros. and then evaluating it in the level two. Um, so that's what we did uh, for four million steps also. So you can execute this cell to just uh, make your um, different Mario's, the actor critic one, the basic one, and the curious one, both trained into the in the level one, but both playing in uh, level two now. Uh, here we have this train parameter to true. So as the agent is now playing in level two, it will continue training in this new environment. You could also stop the training and just see what happens. While this is running, um, we will look at what it looks like in a video. Um, so for the video, we actually don't have the um, um, the standard agent, um, the one that is not curious. But um, I can tell you what's happening with, with it, or you will see in the uh, animation right after. But um, basically, the, the agent is pretty bad uh, in the second level of Mario. Uh, when trained with traditional reinforcement learning. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Uh, if you don't know the game of Mario, you will see it directly. The environment looks totally different. Um, the, the, the background is black, uh, there's no pipes, uh, there's different type of bricks, different type of enemies. Uh, it's the second level, so obviously it's uh, more difficult to solve. So the actions are the same. Uh, in a way, the observation space is the same, like we are looking at four frames uh, uh, of the same size, but the content of the game is totally different. Um, what remained was the, the rule of the game. And even though the rules of the game are, are the same, um, the, the agent performs poorly because the feature ext extractors don't know what to do and don't extract meaningful information from this new, uh, new environment. And um, so uh, actually, this one is um, the one trained without curiosity. We actually have it in the video, so you can see um, how it's happening. And typically here, it gets stuck because never in level one, you have this situation where you would jump over something and it's a dead end. Usually in the first level, you jump over something and that's it. Maybe you will fall into a hole, but uh, you cannot get stuck like that in level one. So our agent, trained only on level one, does the best it can and think, OK, um, usually going right is OK, so I guess I'll do that. 
uh, sometimes jump, but the situation does not evolve. And since it's a pretty useless action to do and the, the state is always the same, we are, we are in this negative uh, loop where the, the reward is almost null, um, the situation doesn't change, there's no reinforcement to do anything else than what the agent is currently doing. So uh, you see this timer here at the top right of the, of the frame. Uh, I could go forward because the agent will stay stuck for the entire game and we have to wait for the timer to go to zero before the agent uh, simply restarts at the beginning. This is to show you how difficult it is to train an agent in an environment and then transfer it to another. So the agent kept the idea of going right, but uh, yeah. Uh, we have one question, uh, which is, uh, would curious learning always be better than uh, normal learning? Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't think so. Um, I mean, better in terms of solving a game or, or finding the optimal way to act in a situation. Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, Mario is a pretty good example of when uh, it, 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 it works because uh, from, the, from the very way Mario is designed, your goal is to see new stuff. So it's very adapted to this notion of if I'm not able to predict what I will see in the next frame, that's good. Um, some games, some games, we don't, we, you don't want that. Or for instance, I, I'm again thinking of uh, self-driving cars. You want your self-driving car to be very sure about what's going to happen next. And if your car has no idea of uh, what the road is going to look like uh, in in one second, uh, you would say it's a pretty bad self-driving car. So again, it's more of a technical tool to encourage your agent to explore and do new things. Um, completely discarding the extrinsic reward only works when you have something like Mario. Um, I think the real um, good stuff will be when we can combine the two sources of reward and automatically now know when to accord uh, importance, when to attach importance to the in extrinsic reward, and when to attach importance to the intrinsic reward. It's really difficult to balance them. So again, the agent is stuck. Um, <laughs> so that happens quite a lot when you change the level. Um, but now if I go forward to our curious agent, So surprisingly, well, maybe not, but the agent still understands that it has to go right. So just like the non-curious agent, um, our curious one understands what's happening in the game. It's doing uh, different things here. Something happening that we didn't see him do before is uh, jumping over the turtle to, to kill the enemies on the other side of that small passage. Um, if we, if we go back previously in the video, the agent is often dying at that point, and um, killing enemies at that point is, is uh, pretty difficult to do. So it's, it's really explaining quite uh, well. Timo, I'm sorry. Uh, my, my question is, uh, is uh, too long to, to write. I'm, uh, so basically, uh, you're saying that, OK, nothing in the case of this uh, game, but in general, you want to, in the case of the, the car, the plane, you exploit it uh, in the real world. But also there it can happen that uh, not every situation you face, you, 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 you say it. So this is uh, a bit dangerous somehow. How, yeah. how much is uh, this uh, dangerous, as, as you know, as far as you well, know? Um, for now, I, I tell that this danger and this risk of applying uh, uh, reinforcement learning at a large scale on these systems. Um, it's preventing the development of the reinforcement learning uh, applications because people don't really trust these models yet because they are so risky and unpredictable. And that's where the potential of artificial curiosity also lies, uh, I think, because uh, here what we'll see is that maybe a curious agent is more able to adapt from a simulation to the real world and will be more robust. 
because these small variations between the, um, the simulation and the real world, the agent will not stay overfit to the simulation doing bad stuff in the real world. The agent will keep that curiosity. And when something happens differently in the real world than in the simulation, it will trigger his curiosity. So it does not necessarily mean that the agent should do that more often, but designing systems that can detect these discrepancies between the simulations and the real world is, I think, something that's going to be pretty important for um, uh, AI safety and subjects like that. Okay, I'm, thank I'm you. not sure I answered completely your question. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. So yeah, you can see that the, the agent uh, is able to, to um, play not worse than the uh, smart one. And there is even a point where uh, we will see the true uh, advantage of uh, if the video uh, loads properly. But yeah, um, so yeah, at that point, uh, the agent is getting stuck uh, in a dead end. Again, that's a situation that uh, the agent doesn't know from the first level, so it does not really know what to do. But you can see here that we, we don't get this flat uh, reward signal and um, the agent is still trying to do new things. The policy is much less um, uh, optimized toward one specific action. Sometimes we can see the agent going left. And here you saw maybe it was too fast, but the agent actually got out uh, just by exploring more. Unfortunately, it got back in, um, but still he was able to, to get out of this situation instead of just getting stuck and continuing uh, uh, running into the wall. Because the more the agent sees this state and sees the same frame again and again and does the same action again and again, the, more, the less surprise uh, it is. So in this situation, the agent knows uh, with time, it can predict that going right is not going to change anything. So he's less and less curious about this situation. And that's how, hopefully, the agent can get out of that situation. So it's not instantaneous. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot of noise in the choices the agent makes. But at some point, the agent will be able to just get out by basically getting bored of this dead end in the environment. Yeah, that was here. So yeah. And it got out. And watch what's happening as the, the window, the frame on the environment start to slide to unveil what's happening to the right side, because the agent never went so far. And suddenly, it's going to discover what's happening on the right. You see the value function, the huge spike in the value function, because suddenly, the agent is not able to predict what's going to happen next. Uh, what's going to happen next used to be, I'm facing the wall, and it doesn't change. And suddenly, it's uh, some totally new part of the game. Um, and you see the reward climbing and the value climbing. So I will now get um, let the Axel uh, conclude. Uh, I hope you you saw um, you can still run the videos in the notebooks, etc. Uh, I hope you saw the interest of uh, curious reinforcement learning. Maybe before we switch to Excel, we have yeah. one, well, or why we switch to Excel, we have more and more questions. Uh, do you think that Tesla autopilot should be curious in order in order to learn? Um, so as I said, uh, uh, while the um, while the car is not trained yet, uh, all possibilities to try to make it more robust and uh, explore new stuff uh, is probably good. Uh, then once people are using the car, uh, you don't want any surprise. And the whole goal of these techniques is precisely to make the agent more reliable. So. Uh, 
maybe some kind of artificial curiosity could be used, uh, for instance, to discover um, new routes, new paths uh, to get to a destination mm -hmm. or stuff like that. But when it comes to actually um, um, controlling the car, uh, I'm not sure this is the right idea. Uh, at least I wouldn't uh, go in a car that's uh, controlled by a curious agent. Mm -hmm. I, w I would also like to add on that, uh, that uh, your forward uh, model is trying to make predictions about what is going to happen. Uh, and if it finds something which is weird, uh, it's going to have kind of a spike, um, I would say, a spike of activity. I'm going to use a wrong word for that. But uh, you could potentially use this to, as Tibor said, potentially identify new routes or also identify things which do not make any sense. and Maybe, for example, you know, the, the videos of the comets uh, flying over Russia usually uh, because everyone has a camera there. You would be able to map these uh, because potentially those ha events do not happen often. Um, so now I'm going to finish uh, with a few concluding words about. Up, all right. I know. So, as we said, uh, curious reinforcement learning has a lot of advantages. You do not need to implement a reward, um, and you use a non-sparse uh, you use a non-sparse reward function because you're always going to try to find something um, to reward your agent with by using this uh, surprise as proxy. Uh, you're going to learn the exploration strategy automatically. Uh, and you also learn a model of the environment, so you do not need to understand the environment completely in order to, to, to be able to, to, to create a system where the agent can learn. And finally, you can also transfer this uh, to other environments, as Steve has shown uh, with the switch to second level. So these are some of the advantages. And we have been talking about uh, one of the problems uh, of uh, the previous reinforcement learning, which is sometimes you can get stuck in exploitation. Um, if you consider the model that we have right now by being curious, whenever he sees something new, uh, it's going to be rewarded for that. Maybe some of you uh, have already uh, seen it whenever you're using apps uh, such as Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you're continuously scrolling. One of the reasons for that is because you're always going to find something something new. And before all the social media and all these apps, uh, you also had uh, televisions. Uh, and usually people would be watching TV uh, a lot of the time, maybe switching between the different channels just to, to get some excitement because they want to know what happens. And this is actually a problem that happens also for our uh, artificial uh, uh, curious uh, model, curious uh, model trained with curious reinforcement learning, where you had uh, in this uh, research, so large scale study of curiosity driven learning, where an agent was walking in a labyrinth, and the objective was, of course, to try to find its way out. But by actually installing a TV, in the labyrinth with randomly showing pictures uh, in the on this TV, the agent would get stuck um, in front of this uh, in front of this TV. So for, for, for those who, who know uh, in computing you can't really have a real random number. So in theory, if you have enough uh, computing resources and enough time, potentially uh, this pseudo-random uh, variations uh, could be learned uh, by the by the model and after I don't know how many years the, the model would say okay I know can be predict what is going to happen later and would then leave of course this is a big uh, field of study uh, a field of research sorry and uh, they have already um, researchers that are actually solving this issue we're not going to go over them um, in the GitHub, you will find a lot of uh, documentation about uh, different research papers that we have been using in order to, to answer these, uh, to, to create this presentation. So in conclusion, uh, so reinforcement learning uh, has a certain aspect of creativity uh, that can beat humans by finding new optimal solutions. But uh, the issue with the standard reinforcement learning is that it requires rewards and a reward function. 
curious reinforcement learning can be a solution to this problem. But of course, beware of the couch potato problem. So thank you very much. Uh, and now we open for any questions that you may have. So I really want to thank uh, Axel, Gaetan and Tibolt for, for this great presentation. I think uh, this is super rewarding for you as well. Uh, I saw a lot of engagement from our participants. So this again is a reward. 